Thank you everybody for joining us tonight for Sing Ray's webinar of the month. We are going to be talking about photographing Washington's volcanoes, all in camera, of course, because that is Randall's uh, Randall Hodges' uh, specialty. A little bit about Randall. He has been capturing images of the Western United States and Canada as a full-time professional photographer for over 20 years. Most of his work comes from time spent hiking and backpacking in the wilderness areas of the West where he has hiked and photographed over 33,000 trail miles. Randall's work has been published over 4,950 times worldwide in books, magazines, calendars, greeting cards, postcards, newspapers, and much more. His work has been in National Geographic, National Photographer Magazine, Northwest Travel Magazine, Oregon Coast Magazine, Seattle Magazine, just to name a few. He has won countless awards for photography, and he does not get, alter his work in any way. He considers himself an all-in-camera shooter as he spends the time to wait for the right light and color and uses old school techniques rather than post-processing to capture his images. Only the smallest adjustments are made to ensure the finished print matches the back of the camera as closely as possible. His work has been featured in countless galleries and art shows around the West. He speaks at photography conventions and seminars, and he teaches his out in the field lessons and adventures around the West where he shares his old school techniques on digital cameras with his students. He has a book, Images of the West, a 208 page full color landscape photography book featuring 20 years of his unforgettable photography of the West. And he owns a the Randall J. Hodges Photography Gallery in downtown Edmonds, Washington, and the Images of the West Gallery in beautiful Cannon Beach, Oregon. And with that, Randall, I'll let you take it. Well done, Michelle. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm going to take you on a little adventure here. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, Last uh, month, those of you who were with us, we focused a little more on lesson format for the webinar. Um, we're going to dive a little bit into that, but this time we're going to go a little bit more on an adventure uh, as I'm going to share a tale of one of my backpacking trips summer before last um, to photograph all five of Washington's big five. I call them the big five, which is uh, Mount Rainier, Mount Baker, Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, and Glacier Peak photograph all five of the big volcanoes in an 18-day hiking and backpacking adventure, uh, which was happened the second and third week of July. So let's uh, move forward here. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about camera setup. We really covered that a lot over the last webinar, uh, but I want I want you to kind of have a grasp of how I do this all in camera. Uh, to start with, um, thanks, Michelle, for the great introduction there. I am an all in camera shooter, but I want to make it clear that that doesn't mean I'm a post processing hater or I don't like or follow photographers who do post processing. Uh, no, I do this this way because one, it makes me happy. I always say uh, there's only one right way in photography and that's your way. And if your way is making you happy, then you're doing it right. Uh, this way makes me very happy to do it all in camera. And also it is how I'm unique uh, in a world of what I would call over post-process photography. Um, I've just switched gears and went the other way and stuck to old school film techniques, which I now do on a digital camera. I got started back in slide film and transparency days, and I've just figured out how to shoot that same style on a digital camera. So I'm not a hater of post-processing. My goal for my uh, students is to get them as close to not needing it as possible. Um, just a, a little bit about how I shoot. Uh, I do shoot in raw because I probably get that question, but to do all in camera work and to access your camera's color features, you have to convert that raw file in the software that came with the camera. Uh, meaning you cannot open the raw file in Photoshop or Lightroom as those are stripping programs and they'll strip all the color uh, right out of your photo there. So. For me, it, uh, when I've shot an image in camera, I have to do a file convert save as uh, in the camera software. By the way, I shoot a Canon 5D SR. So for me, that's Canon's uh, DPP4, Digital Photo Professional 4 software. I do a, a quick file convert save as, save it as an 8-bit TIFF, 
a 16-bit TIFF if I know it's going to go for a really, really, really big print. But 8-bit eight TIFFs off my camera make 144 megabyte file. That's already a pretty big file. I do open it in Photoshop and de-dust and check for uh, any sensor dust I might have. I internally copyright and keyword the images, and then I'm done. For me, uh, my whole process takes about 60 seconds a photo, uh, which also allows me more time out in the field, less time on the computer, and I can send my publishers way more images uh, every year. Uh, and for me, I do this for one reason. Um, I love photography, but even more, I love to hike and backpack. So I want to be out there in the field. Uh, a little bit about my camera setup. So uh, like I said, I access the color palettes in my camera and I set them up to mimic my old slide films. Uh, for me, that would be Kodak Elite Chrome, Kodak Ektachrome, Kodak Kodachrome, Fuji Velvia, Fuji Provia, and high contrast black and white. Um, I'll just kind of jump in a little bit about that for a, a, a for a Canon camera. Um, that means we're going to go into the picture styles and we're going to pick some of those picture styles and we're going to go one step further and we're actually going to set up stuff like sharpness, contrast, color hue, saturation, uh, those types of things. Um, if you were in a Nikon, that would be set up under picture control. Uh, if you were Sony, that would be creative styles or color controls. If you're Fuji, Fuji has its own uh, rolls of film, basically, but you can set those globally all at once. You can adjust the contrast, sharpness, saturation, and it'll apply to all the Fuji films in there. And very similar for Olympus and other cameras. Uh, the second thing about in-camera uh, photography is you have to control the white balance in the camera. You cannot leave that. Um, you can't leave that on auto. Let me do a little camera adjustment here. There we go. Uh, if you're doing that on auto, uh, the white balance is never going to be right. Most most guys who run their people who run their cameras on auto white balance will be um, setting that back in Photoshop or letting Photoshop determine their white balance. But for an in-camera shooter, it's critical you control the white balance in the camera. I use light, bright warming polarizers. Uh, any type of polarizer during the day would work. I prefer a light, bright warming polarizer because I often think a polarizer can add a blue cast to a photo. So adding that warming element cancels out the blue cast. Uh, it's not critical anymore because you can always adjust your white balance, but for me, that's what I prefer. And I use a whole host of graduated split neutral density filters. Uh, I carry in my pack a one all in hard graduation, by the way, for in camera shooting softs just don't work. They don't trick the camera. Got to be hard graduation. I have a one stop, two stop, three stop and four stop all in hard graduation and a half a stop uh, that Singray has started making just for me. I request they make that. And then I think they've become a little popular. My students have certainly been buying some of those also. I also use the Randall J. Hodges Mountain V filter, which is a split neutral density filter that instead of a straight line, it creates a V. I use that up high in the mountains. Um, when there's a V in a valley, it helps me out quite a bit. And I do have a two stop solid density filter that I would employ when I need a longer exposure. I don't really use density filters overall. Um, I don't usually need longer exposures too much, but if you want to do a little bit of uh, fun photography with density filters for 10 minute and plus exposures, you sure can. And, uh, but this, this episode, uh, we're not going to focus as much on the technique as we are going to focus more on lighting, timing, composition, and how I come around making these images. Um, we've got a lot of images to get to. Uh, so I would say, this trip started a full year in advance in planning uh, because often nowadays you need reservations at campgrounds, reservations to backpack. Uh, so at least a full year, these trips to start the planning. That's what I love about a trip. It takes a whole year to plan the trip. I take the trip and then I have the photos that last a lifetime. So really a trip lasts almost forever. Uh, so let's get this thing started. Here we go. Uh, first stop on this was Mount Rainier. This is called Grand Park. 
Got a couple of hikers there moving across to give a little scale. Um, and I'm only gonna hit the technique about every third or fourth photo. I really want you to see the transition of how light and composition works. Uh, this was shot aperture priority F20. You're gonna see I use F18, F20, F22 almost all the time. Uh, 1 30th of a second, I use my exposure compensation to darken it by two thirds of a stop. You're also gonna notice a lot of my photos I have darkened a little bit. Uh, ISO 200 only because I needed to get those hikers frozen. Uh, normally I would shoot at ISO 100 or 50. White balance for this is 5600K in that landscape roll of film. Whenever you hear me say landscape, that means I shot it in what I call my Kodak Elite Chrome uh, color palette, which is a digital color palette. But uh, since I'm so old school, I, I often you'll hear rolls of film. I don't mean that. I mean digital color palette. A uh, light, bright, warming polarizer, and I handheld a one-stop split neutral density filter just over the mountain to get that light balance right in the camera. All right, let's get this adventure. So oh, go ahead. Questions already. Um, what do you mean when you say the graduated neutral density uh, tricks the camera? So when you put a split neutral, like in this photo, there is a split neutral density filter basically almost down to halfway in the image, right down to the base of that mountain. I have darkened the sky. It tricks the camera into thinking the entire exposure is the same, so it can get a more balanced exposure. If you've ever shot a photo, even on your cell phone, without a graduated split neutral density filter during sunrise or sunset, you probably notice if your sky looks good, your ground is very dark. If your ground looks good, your sky is too bright or washed out. By darkening the sky with that split neutral density filter, it tricks the camera into thinking it's a balanced exposure and it actually changes the camera's shutter speed, takes a little longer exposure and we get a balanced exposure. Great question though. All right, moving on here. Next shot up in the series, you can see it's gotten quite a bit later. Um, the hikers are gone and now my flowers are no longer in sun which I love when the, when the light is not on flowers, they get way more pop, more color. The sun can tend to wash them out. Uh, but that also means uh, it's getting late in the day and about an hour, hour and a half before sunset, I take the polarizer off, it starts working incorrectly. I put my graduated split neutral density filter holder on and uh, it'll hold the filter for me. And in this one, you see I went from the last photo a one-stop split to now a three-stop split, meaning a lot darker on top to balance light between that sky and that foreground. Uh, again, um, same technique, aperture priority F20, the shutter speed you can see got longer, one-tenth of a second. I left the ISO at 200, I had just a little wind. I'm trying to slow those flowers down. And you can also see my white balance went up to 6,000K and again, that three-stop grad. And do you lock the exposure before you add the filter? No, you need to put the filter on first because the camera is going to re-meter. It's got to re-meter with that filter on. If you meter before you put the filter on, you're going to lock the exposure. You're going to drop the filter on. The exposure is going to be incorrect. Aperture priority means the camera is constantly trying to help you with the shutter speed. I go ahead and let it, and then I force it darker. Uh, here's the third photo in that series. And last, as you can see, the clouds are coming in. They're going to knock out Mount Rainier, which they did. Um, I love this peekaboo effect, though, this look here. Um, same technique, F20, one-tenth of a second, ISO 200, one-stop dark. I often darken my photos when I'm an after priority. I tend to think cameras try to shoot the photos a little too bright for my liking. Uh, and the white balance went up again as it gets later, the flowers turn the shade light in the foreground starts to get bluer and bluer. So we have to raise up that white balance to offset that. And again, that three stop split neutral density filter. Uh, this ended the night uh, up here at Mount Rainier at Grand Park. It was about a five mile hike in, which left an epic five mile night hike out through this glorious meadow you can't see behind, but this meadow goes on for a couple more miles. And uh, that blue hour dusk time is so gorgeous in the forest. I just love night hiking. And Where was the focal point on that shot? 
Oh, that's great. Let's go back. I should have talked about focus. Focus for me is always because I'm not focal stacking. I'm using a small aperture to create a big depth of field. Focus is always in the foreground. Now there's a flower in the center right in the front. That is not my focus point. That would be too close, stretching the lens too far. But if you count straight back from that one, two, three purple flowers, that's my focal point. Usually about 10% into the photo. I'll pinpoint on something. Sometimes I even turn on my live view and I use the zoom button to zoom in on just one flower. Um, I use a loop a viewing device for the back of my camera and I can actually see hair on those uh, lupin and I know I'm pinpoint focused. So great question. Always focus in your foreground. Every lens is slightly different, but I try to teach my students about 10 or 15% into that photo. We get a little what's called back focus. That's why those first flowers still look pretty sharp. But had I focused on the very first flower, Mount Rainier would be a little soft. So just a little ways into the foreground. All right, on to the next location. We've changed uh, regions. It was about a four and a half hour drive from Mount Rainier to the Goat Rocks Wilderness in, uh, with Mount Adams. Uh, these are the actual Goat Rocks though to start this shootout. And um, let's just do a little bit here, aperture priority. Uh, by the way, the lens was set at 35 millimeters. You can kind of pay attention to where that lens is, lens is to see uh, how wide I'm going. F20, six tenths of a second, one and a third stops dark, ISO 100, 5400K. When you have that late light that is just cutting across that photo there, that's got a lot of um, glow to it. So we usually turn the white balance down a little 5400k. And off of that, we get some reflected light down in our foreground. So we're not getting that blue effect yet in the and again, focal on this isn't that first uh, fuzzy top flowers there the pask flowers, it would be the second grouping. So just a little ways into that. And this, by the way, is a three, uh, three day backpack, a two night backpack. So I got to stay out here in these beautiful meadows. How do you determine the correct white balance? You just look at the back of the camera. So uh, this is one thing I ask my students, at least for their first class, turn off the histogram or do not pay attention to your histogram. I really want you to get you in tune with you looking at the back of the camera and you making the determination on whether you have a great photo or not. Uh, down the road, if you want to bring the histogram back in, use it as a guide. But just remember, histogram is to help you take a series of photos or a photo to be post-processed. Your eyeball will be much better at determining a photo for all in camera. And you can also see on this one, a four-stop split neutral density filter. There's a light, lot of light up there on top. Uh, so we have to darken that sky even more to keep that balance. And the only way to find balance is to slide a filter in and take a picture and see if the, the top and the bottom look like they're both the right exposure. If my sky came out too dark and my foreground was too bright, I'd have too much filter on. If my foreground was still a little dark and my sky was a little washed out, I don't have enough filter on. Uh, it takes a little practice to get those split neutral density filters down, but once you master them, they change your photography forever. Here was the next shot, but I moved locations and pointed the camera towards Mount Adams. Love that little beam of clouds heading across there. Uh, same exact setup, you'll see uh, F20, one sec, uh, aperture priority, one second exposure, one stop dark ISO 100, white balance is up a little, it's getting later, 6200K. And now instead of a straight four stop, I'm using a three and a one stop and they're offset a little. Sometimes with a really dark filter, like a four stop, you'll see the filter line. And here I wanted the filter in two places, one right, at the, right in the cloud and one a little bit lower. That helps blend out that split neutral density filter. And what time of year was this? What month did you go? Uh, this is the third week of July. Nice. All right. And so let's look at the, how the light changed here. This is a, probably about a 10 or 15 minute difference in photo here. Uh, by the way, I'm shooting 24 millimeters, which on my 24 to 105 is as wide as I can go. And when I backpack, I try not to bring another lens. 
weight is an issue. Uh, by the way, when I left the car for a three night trip, my pack weighed 62 pounds. So you can see adding another two and a half pound lens matters. All right, look at that. We're getting more into Alpenglow now. Uh, same, pretty much the same shot. I zoomed in just a little bit to 27 millimeters. Aperture priority F20, but let's look back. Look at this exposure here. One second. Now I'm up to 5.2 seconds and I'm two thirds of a stop dark in ISO 100. White balance is 5,900K and I'm still using that three plus one equal four stops on that split neutral density filter. And what time of day do you go out to get that out below? Well, oh, that happens. Uh, this is probably 10 minutes after sunset. 15 minutes after, and the Alpine Glow got a whole lot stronger. Uh, don't leave right after the sun sets. You might miss the best photo. Sometimes I'm out 45 minutes after sunset shooting photos, sometimes an hour. So don't leave too early. All right. And while that was going on in front of me, this is going on behind me. Uh, I literally flipped the camera around as fast as I could. Uh, set up a comp as quick as I could without moving. I didn't want to move because I like that Mount Adams comp so good. Uh, and what really changed in this is I had to put another filter on. Now I'm pointed directly at the sun. The first shot, the fork down came out very dark. The sky was overexposed. Slap another filter, a four plus one stop in. I'm using five stops to balance light. All right, now I've gone to bed and got back up early in the morning. In July, it's getting pretty dang early. And this is pre Alpenglow, so before sunrise. Uh, no polarizer on, split neutral density filter on. Um, I'm up a little higher. I was able to put a straight four stop on there. Uh, same settings, F20, 1.6 seconds, two thirds of a stop dark. Uh, la that landscape roll of film, 6200K in that white balance. Uh, after uh, this morning, uh, we took a bunch more shots, uh, but I, I had to limit this down. I could have easily put up 100 photos, but I wanted to show our hike. So we took off for a morning hike to go hike the Cascade Crest, uh, which is actually the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, you don't see it in this picture, but the Cascade Crest actually uh, is a knife's edge you're hiking on. And in one eye, you've got Eastern Washington and the other eye, you've got Western Washington, but you have to keep your eyes down, look at your feet so you don't fall off the mountain. I have a rule, a dead photographer is not a very good photographer. So I try to stay alive. Uh, now I've got my light bright warming polarizer back on and I'm hand holding that one stop split neutral density filter over the sky to balance out this nice exposure. You see a little uh, snowpack there in the left in a circuit, that's actually a frozen goat lake. Uh, now we're back uh, by camp and we're back at the Goat Rocks, but we're up another 500 feet up the trail. That meadow still went on and I really wanted to get a great trail shot with that glowing Goat Rocks. And you can see I use the exact same settings, F20, eight tenths of a second, ISO 100, 5600K, uh, because there's a pretty straight line there where the uh, light is. Uh, four stop split neutral density filter work great. I just love the pops of red and I love that last glow on the mountain. And now I'm gonna shoot a sunset from up higher, quite a bit higher than the night before. And way down in there is my camp somewhere. Um, and now we're just have a, a commanding look over this meadow and same, same uh, technique there. The lens was 30 millimeters, aperture priority F20, 1.6 seconds, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 100. 5,800K in that white balance, four stop split on. I use that four stop a lot. For my students, I just recommend getting a one, two, and three stop in hard to start. I uh, don't want you to break the bank right away, but you can always put a three and a one together to make those four stops. We had a question along those lines, actually. Why does overlapping a three stop and a one stop offset work to trick the camera, but a soft step graduated doesn't work? He uses both. Um, okay, so a three and a one offset by an eighth of an inch uh, still leaves a hard, a pretty hard line for the camera. A soft filter, it almost starts to graduate right away from the top and it graduates well through the middle of it. 
which means there's no hard line to stick anywhere. And the camera is not fooled. All it's done is darken the sky a little bit. Uh, if I was to use a soft, it would be in conjunction with a hard filter. Uh, a soft filter is never going to switch my camera's exposure, and I'm always going to end up pushing it way too far down into the foreground in order to get a dark enough sky. So for me, my personal preference and what I recommend to my students is don't need to bother with soft filters, uh, just use hards. I will say I have some post-processing friends who use soft filters. They're only using it to try to darken the very top of their sky a little bit. They're gonna still take multiple exposures that they're gonna blend together in Photoshop in some fashion. And here we go. So you can see what's happened here between this shot and this shot. Those clouds just moved right in there and filled up the valley, adding a little extra drama to this photo. All right, we've moved on from that two day backpack and we've done a uh, move to Mount St. Helens, done a four and a half mile hike in the afternoon, scouted all around, uh, found a spot finally after a big search that I had shot maybe 10 years before. And that is Spirit Lake. Uh, we did not have a uh, little bit of smoke in the sky and we did not have any cloud drama to speak of. And the wildflowers were a little poorer than usual in this location. Uh, but this is where I was. And this was, I used the Randall J. Hodges Mountain V filter. And you can see exactly why. Uh, this is set up in that perfect V. And so a three-stop uh, Mountain V filter worked great. And I had to put a one-stop filter over it because the three-stop wasn't quite enough. And onward, uh, looking out in the other direction from this view, uh, about a 100-yard run to go see Mount Adams in Alpenglow. Uh, aperture priority F20, half a second exposure, one dar stop dark. ISO is up way higher. I would never be able to make a print of this at a thousand because it was just windy. Um, and for me, an ISO that high means no big print. It would never make my website, but I'm still out there and I still want to capture a photo and use all my technique to the best of my ability. Now that I'm looking away from the sun, I could get away with less filters. So I dropped down to a straight three stop hard. Uh, we moved on to another location that is Sheep Lake down in there. Uh, this is on the east side of Mount Rainier National Park. We've hiked up to a pass here and we're looking back out over Sheep Lake and to the left is Mount Adams and to the right is Mount St. Helens. Uh, I hiked a lot further up the ridge, found a great view of Mount Rainier, but I could tell the sun was setting right behind it that the light was not going to be good for in-camera photography. It would have taken multiple exposure blending. So I returned back to something that's in my wheelhouse and just the one Alpenglow shot on this night, four stop split neutral density filter, F20, two second exposure, one stop dark ISO 100, white balance 6500K. You'll see that white balance shifts around a lot. Generally, for mountain photography, that white balance is going to land between five and 7,000. Generally, that doesn't mean I shoot some in the 4,000 all the way up to 10,000. So I, I really use that white balance to try to make sure the greens are green. I'm seeing the color I'm seeing in the sky and doing that right in the camera. And are you using a tripod? If so, which one? Oh, every single shot. I should have mentioned that. Uh, I use a Gitzo Traveler tripod with a Gitzo Traveler head. There's not one shot you'll ever see that is a landscape shot that I shoot that is not on a tripod. The only time I would take my camera off a tripod is to do a macro shot of a wildflower and or a tulip or something. And only because it's so low to the ground, I'm practically laying on the ground. So and plus, usually when I'm shooting macro, I'm shooting a very fast exposure. Uh, but this is a two second picture. You can't do that handheld. And a tripod, this is a great question. A tripod is equally important for another reason, composition. Now, if I was hand holding this shot with a split neutral density filter set up on, I'm trying to get the filter set and I'm trying to get this composition, Every single time I take a photo, it's going to be different. I'm never going to get back to my same composition. You can't see it in this photo, but I nitpicked this composition and every other composition before it to death. 
I set up a composition, I take a photo, I look at all four corners of the picture. Can I rebalance it? Yes. In this one, I didn't catch that Mount St. Helens was in my picture at first. My picture was more centered toward Mount Adams. But because I was on a tripod, I got to just swivel it, take a shot, move it, take a shot, keep pinpointing. Once that composition is dialed in, I don't have to move the camera. You will be a much better photographer, even if you're shooting fast exposures, if you use a tripod. Great question. All right, on to the next one. Uh, yet another hike. This uh, We moved away from Sheet Lake and we backpacked into Gorge Lake. My camp is down there in that photo. You can barely see a couple spots uh, on the right side of that lake. That's me and my buddy's tents there. And we have uh, hiked well above up on a high ridge to shoot. Believe it or not, Mount Rainier is supposed to be in this photo, but that is one of the things about photography. You don't always get the light you're looking for, but I still get out, I still show up, and who knows what I'm gonna get. I always set out with an intention of a photo I'm gonna get, but I keep my mind open and I shoot the light and the photos that come my way. Uh, this is aperture priority, F20, one eighth of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100, 50, 800K, three stop split neutral density filter, um, and actually, I could have showed you 20 shots from just this foggy event that was happening. Uh, it was really spectacular. Never did see Mount Rainier, but uh, got a whole series of great photos. And what sort of shutter release device are you using for your long exposures? I I'm using a plug-in cable release, just an old school plug-in cable release. It doesn't have a battery in it. It's not fancy. Um, it, I, I like a wired cable release, not a remote. Those uh, for my students, I've just seen over time, they fail a lot. Some people show up thinking they're gonna use their phone to fire off their camera. Well, now you've got your phone in your hand. You're trying to you know, fire off this when you might need your hands to hold a filter. You might need your hands to adjust your comp. Your, it, it's a plug-in cable release is simple. I can hold it in my hand and adjust the camera while I'm firing photos, adjust my filter and fire photos. Um, for me, it works. And when I take long star photos, I need a locking cable release. So uh, that's what I use there. So here's another shot from that series where the sun, oh, it's coming out. It's going to happen. We're going to see Mount Rainier. No, I'm sorry. That never actually did happen. This was as clear as it got that night. But I still love this photo. It has lots of drama in it that great heather just popping out in that foreground there and then again looking at all four corners of my box to make sure i don't have a negative space or a distracting space so uh, i moved around on this ridge quite a bit trying to get that lake in an area that i was happy with with the ridge line the the two ridges that are cutting through there in the middle but light was making me change my composition co constantly where it was sneaking out, where it wasn't. I was, this, this was a very busy photo shoot for me. I, I must've moved my camera 50 times in a half an hour. Oh, all right. We moved on to yet another, oh, and by the way, this was a one night backpack to Gorge Lake. We had to hike out and now we've uh, moved the rig. I'm, by the way, I'm when I'm not backpacked in, I'm sleeping in my adventure van Gracie, which is a 2020 Ford Transit all wheel drive that I built into what I call my cabin. Uh, nothing fancy, no shower or toilet in there, but it has a bed, lots of storage, and I can haul all my food in a cooler and that's all I need. So we've gone to, this is Summit Lake. We've just poached, poached camp. You didn't hear that from me, but I camp a lot in trailheads and parking lots, but Nobody saw me there, so don't, don't say nothing. Um, and we hiked up for a sunset. It's about a four mile hike, beautiful hike up here. And we've climbed above the lake to get this fantastic view. And this is an epic series of watching light change. So this, I got my wide angle lens out for this one, uh, 18 millimeters, aperture priority, F20, a third of a 0.3 seconds. One stop dark, like I said, I almost always am shooting my photos a little on the dark side. ISO up just a little bit at 160. There was a little wind. I didn't get it all the way back to 100. Uh, white balance 6400K in that landscape color palette, four stop split neutral density filter. You can see a pretty hard line where that light is out there. 
So it's easy to set a four stop filter right on top of it. And watch this little progression though of light. Well, let's go back and talk about composition here. Um, you can see there's some elements that I just wanted to have in the photo. So yes, the clouds are part of the composition. Uh, I've got cloud on the left, cloud on the right over there. I've got the two uh, frog mountains right there, kind of in the center, Mount Rainier off to the right, another peak uh, ridgeline off to the left, a couple of bare grass there on the left side of the photo. And if you look at the right side of the photo, we've got that old snag and a snag that slides out into the photo from there. And there's a lot of uh, lichen and mosses growing down there, adding some color into this photo. And on the very left bottom corner, you can see I snuck in just a little greenery there, so it wouldn't be just rock. I nitpicked this composition a lot. Uh, I probably took me 20 or 30 photos to get it just how I wanted. And then I just let the clouds go through. So again, I could never have gotten the shot twice without a tripod. I need that okay. tripod. What time of day is this shot? Um, and when the sun is setting, are you changing the white balance as it's going down? Oh yes, absolutely. So as we go through this little series, we'll see if I changed it on this night, but maybe when light's hitting the peak, I'm starting before this, my first shots, you wouldn't see it. They weren't as good. I was at 5,200. And as the light got later, my white balance started creeping up as I went into shade in my foreground there. Uh, so yes, the white balance, I'm always looking at it. I'm always changing it. And sometimes I miss it. I mean, the photo's happening so fast. I make a technical error. I didn't say that and I don't admit to it. All right, on to the next photo here in the series. Now you can see the clouds have changed. The light has changed drastically. A moon is trying to come out. Um, I've had to move my composition a little trying to chase the clouds. I've just zoomed in a little is really all I did on this. Uh, white balance actually dropped down one notch, but I've still got all the other settings except the exposure you'll notice in this photo with more light, 0.3 seconds. And just a few minutes later, 3.2 seconds, getting much longer. Move on to the next photo, getting much, it's still 3.2 seconds, but look how fast this is probably, there's probably 30 seconds in between these two shots. And Mount Rainier's back out, the moon's gone. And then we move on to the next shot here. Oh, jackpot, hit the jackpot. The moon came out, I got Mount Rainier. Clouds have rushed back in. And look at that, I'm all the way up to a 12 second exposure all right, already. And you'll notice I went from a four stop split neutral density filter to a three. Because as we get into Alpen Glow, the light gets more balanced, it's less harsh. We can back off those filters quite a bit. I really, really love this photo. So out of this series, two of these made my website here. We'll back up a little bit. This one, and this one's actually in both of my galleries. And this one, um, and this one will probably end up in the galleries because I've sold a few of the prints on the website. That's usually a pre pretty good indicator that uh, it's well received. All right, now we move locations again. We are, uh, so, so far we've done uh, Mount Rainier, then we went to Mount Adams, and then we went to Mount St. Helens, then we went back to Mount Rainier, and now we're still on Mount Rainier, but we're on a different hike and we're poach camp in the parking lot at Tolme Peak, and I'm up on the summit of Tolme Peak in Mount Rainier National Park. And this is looking straight out towards Puget Sound, away from the view. Uh, but this is where the color hit first. And I'm always attracted to color. Sometimes color dictate, dictates composition. So I'm shooting in the complete wrong uh, direction, but a simple shot with just some alpine trees in the foreground, a three plus a two stop graduated split neutral density filter. When you're shooting right into the sun, you've got to knock down a lot of that bright sky in order to balance your exposure. And then we'll move on. Now I'm taking a side shot and that's Mount St. Helens again, way out there in the distance. I've switched from the five stops of filter to just four stops of filter. Uh, the white balance has gone down to 6,000 K, one stop dark at that aperture priority F20, 1.6 seconds. And then as we continue, now this is the real view, uh, but I just want to make note of that. Don't always get so stuck on what you think you came to shoot 
that you might miss other photos. Keep your eyes open. Uh, before I even got my camera out, I scouted the whole area and I, I looked at where I thought the sun would land and what I might shoot. It always pays to show up a little early and scout your compositions. And actually in this composition, I set out three rocks to mark my tripod. So I could run around the rest of the mountain and come right back to my tripod spot. Uh, this is a aperture priority F20, 1.6 seconds, one stop dark, ISO 100, 5800K in that landscape roll of film, a three plus a one again, I'm offsetting the filters. I've got a three just below the ridge line and a one set down below that to blend into that shade area. And then and we'll do move. Do you change the landscape color settings with different landscapes or keep it the same? Generally, I keep it the same and I shoot landscape about 90% of the time in my photography. If you had joined us in the last webinar on fall color, you'll see I hardly ever shot the landscape color palette. I was shooting the standard color palette all the time because fall color can be so intense in color that it overwhelms the camera. So in my Canon, the standard is set up with less color pop for whenever there's too much color, which does happen. Uh, sometimes you see a sunset, it's so intense out here in the West that even, even your arms are glowing red. That's going to be incredibly hard to gather up and control in the camera. So it's always good to have more than one color palette and you use that along with a lower white balance to really contain that color. And let's move on to our next one here. So look at the difference here. You know, 15 minutes, the sun, and I shot a whole series of fantastic photos. There's just no way I could show them all to you. Uh, but then we end up right in blue hour and everybody else has left. Nobody took this picture, um, which I thought was too bad. That's a fantastic photo. Uh, you can see though, that's a 32 second picture. So I'm still using my uh, same technique, except I had to back off to F18. So I get that 32 second exposure, two thirds of a stop dark. And now I've gone, so you watch me go from five stops of filter to four stops of filter. Now I'm down to three stops of filter as the light has become more balanced. And now we're gonna move on to another hike on Mount Rainier. Luckily, I did not have to move my van. There are two trailheads out of this, or two trails out of the same trailhead. This is called Spray Park. Uh, the last hike to Tolme Peak was about four miles in, which left about a four mile night hike out. This is quite a bit further, five and a half miles in. Um, and actually, uh, me and my buddy went up early and we added a couple of extra miles that scouting a higher location up behind this. But and from that high location, I could see where the flower meadows were. So then we we're able to return and find the flower meadow. Um, this is a great series. It's really going to show how light changes and how scouting around in advance can help you. Uh, because before we even arrived here, I scouted out a, a couple of tarns and picked one I wanted to also shoot. Found this flower meadow, but couldn't see the whole thing. Got up really high on a ridge, took a practice shot up there. Uh, decided, nope, that's not going to be my sunset spot. I'd already taken a practice shot here and I knew I liked this area better. Got back down, found a better area in the flower meadow took this shot uh, with early, this is probably four o'clock, five o'clock, still got that light bright warming polarizer on and a one stop grad over the top at a 5,800K white balance. But the other techniques, very similar, F20, one sixth of a second, one stop dark. Now, there's a point in the evening when the polarizer starts to hurt you rather than help you. I was right at that time. You can see the right side of this photo is quite a bit darker than the left side of this photo. And I tried to, ba I tried to balance the polarizer more to the left, but then it just pulled a, a lighter spot on the right side of the photo. That's when you know it's time to take off the polarizer and just go to a straight split neutral density filter setup. And which I did right after this, I knew it was time for the polarizer to be gone, but I wanted to show you this photo because a lot of people ask, how do you know just look how uneven that sky is, and then you know. Um, and the same thing in the morning, you start with graduated split neutral density filter for sunrise. You probably shoot that setup a full hour, hour and a half after sunrise before you get out of polarizer, which works best in the middle of the day. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that, but I, I'm gonna take that back a minute. If you're down in the forest and no sky is involved, you can run a polarizer all day, but not when a sky is involved. 
All right, let's move through this series so you can see, and, and we'll pay attention to composition and lighting here. Now I'm at that tarn that I had scouted out and I had taken a practice photo here. So I know exactly what I wanted. And I love taking those practice photos because if I'm having a hard time refining a composition, I can go back and look at a practice photo and get that composition back. I know right where I want to stand. Once again, I marked my tripod feet, which is very helpful for me. I wanted that little alpine tree in the right hand part of my bottom corner. And I wanted that little uh, peninsula on the left hand out there. I wanted that rock in the photo, and I love the way this uh, tarn snakes its way towards Mount Rainier there. Um, and here I've just got a, a two-stop graduated split neutral density filter, and you can see my sky is much smoother across the top there. So it was a good call for me to take off that polarizer. F20, 1 25th of a second, one-stop dark ISO 100. And by the way, this is about a half a mile from the other photo location. So at this time of night, I'm hot footing it. I'm really making a move between locations. Uh, here, I've just waited a few minutes and changed to another composition. Shot that tarn again. Like this, plenty good. The foreground is really nice with a couple of islands in there and helping frame the reflection of Mount Rainier. Uh, just really love all in both these shots, all the details of the landscapes there. Even left of Mount Rainier, you can see that volcanic plug sitting there all red and in the reflection. And notice where I position that in the reflection right over there by that peninsula. Look at all four corners of your picture and, and notice more than just your main subject. A lot of people get too stuck on their main subject and they're not looking at the rest of the photo. All right, and then from there, it's a big scramble, run all the way back to the flower meadow and you can see I got there just in time. There's just last light scooting across those lupins. And uh, the white bounce is low be at 5,600K because that's warm light. You know, when that sun's really low in the sky, that is super warm light. So we need to offset that with a cooler white balance. Now I'm, I'm not gonna move my camera. You're just gonna get to see a series of photos as light changes here. Look at that, there's just a, three or four minutes between that photo and that photo. And look how much more pop is in those lupins now as the light is starting to leave them. That purpley blue is really starting to come out. And then on to the next shot. Now we're really seeing the blue in those uh, Texas people would say those blue bonnets are popping now. Uh, really seeing that. And I moved up to a three stop split neutral density filter as I'm balancing more and more light from top to bottom. And now look at that, that big color change there. Now I'm getting that hard shadow line. And so you can see I've added a one-stop split neutral density filter. You can also see the white balance is elevated to 5,900K. Shutter speed has gone from fast to getting slower, quarter of a second, one-stop dark in F20. On to the next photo there, a little bit later. Now I'm a third of a second, still using that three plus one. And now the light, the light has just left. And look at that shutter speed jump up to 10 seconds. And I've been able to, now the light's more balanced. I pulled out that one stop. So I'm just rocking a three stop split neutral density filter. And my white balance, we started at 56, then 58, 59, six. Now we're up to 6,500K. And the last shot of the night, I'm up to 16 seconds. Uh, 6200K, three stop split neutral density filter and a perfect balanced blue hour photo there, really showing off those lupins. It's amazing to me how much more pop you get out of your flowers when they go into shade light. What a fun night. And I still had a five and a half mile hike back to the car. Let's just say we were uh, that day finished with 15 miles total of hiking. And uh, yeah, I went right to sleep. Skip sunrise, by the way. Yep, that happens. Could not get up. All right, we've moved locations. We've gone north about three hours, four hours to the uh, Mount Baker, Mount Shooksan area. That's Mount Shooksan in the photo there. This is another poach camp in the parking lot with about a two and a half, three mile hike up in the afternoon. And this was a big scouting mission. Got up early, scouted. Oh, I don't know. I don't think I ever found all my tripod marks again, but I think I had 10 of them I thought I would get to during a sunset. That was a little too, uh, little too much to handle. 
but you can see that late afternoon light, the white balance is down to 5,400K, but I still got good enough light to have that polarizer on with a one-stop handheld filter over it to balance that light. And you can see the same kind of technique, F20. It's 1 20th of a second, one-stop dark. If you've been watching my exposure compensation, every photo has been on the dark side. And this is called, by the way, Skyline Divide. Beautiful hike. There's my doggy, Foxy. Uh, we picked her up after leaving Mount Rainier because dogs aren't allowed in the national parks on trails. And this was her first really big backpacking and hiking adventure. Uh, she's just about two years old in this adventure. Uh, no, a little less, one and a half or so. Been hardcore into training. And there she is starring in her photos. She's starting a lot of photos since then. Uh, and you'll also see my ISO went up a little bit, so I get one fifty of a second, so I can make sure and freeze action on the doggy. Uh, F twenty one fifty of the second, fifty six hundred K. You can see the white balance has already kicked up a couple notches. Still got that polarizer and that one stop graduated split neutral density filter on. Now the lights getting later. I've run over uh, towards Mount. You can get both Mount Shooks and out Mount Baker. So we're back in the volcanoes here. And you can see I'm just getting that last dappled light across the flowers. I love that look. Uh, white balance up to 5,800K now. Uh, F20, one, three tenths of a second, one stop dark, four stop filter, because now our, we're in shade in the foreground again, and we've got light on that mountain. So we really have to balance that light. But a nice straight line where that light's hitting. So a four stop hard worked beautifully. Uh, just a little more zoomed in there, uh, trying to frame a different composition. And in both these photos, all of these flower photos, I'm looking at both the left and right hand corner. I couldn't get a flower in each corner in this picture. As I zoom in, I'm trying to make sure I get flowers in the corners there so there's no uh, blank areas in there. And there's still just the last dapple of light hitting a couple of those flowers out in there. Great time to be shooting. Uh, my white balance ticked up again to 5,900K, still got the four stop on, one stop dark, but you'll also see that ISO had to jump up there because these flowers are moving a little bit. I don't want that ISO up there, but uh, as patient as I try to be, sometimes I still want to walk away with a photo. So up, up went the ISO. Uh, this was a hillside shot I had scoped out. I really like the density of the flowers. So again, I'm running from one location to the next to the next, trying to shoot as many shots as I can. 6,200K, a three plus one stop. I had to get the four stop out of there so I could have one stop down at the bottom of the mountain and one pushed a little bit into those flowers where light was still hitting. Uh, ISO dropped to 200, one fifth of a second. So you can see a little bit of movement there, especially on the left side of the bottom there, a couple of flowers blowing there. I'd actually rather have blowing flowers than shoot with a high ISO because I just can't make prints with a high ISO. Even later still, white balance, again, you'll see a pattern here. White balance is up to 6,000K, uh, 1 12th of a second. ISO is all the way up to 800, which just, it just kills me, but I didn't want to walk away with no shot here. Uh, now that the light is is balancing out, I've dropped back to a three stop split neutral density filter. Back at Mount Shooksand, that was a nice couple football field run to get back in position over here for Alpenglow. You'll see that white balance up again, 6,400K. Luckily the wind was dying down. The ISO drops to 200, six tenths of a second, three stop filter. Um, all these adjustments, which for students that are, I'm teaching in the beginning, it's a lot, it's a lot to try to remember, you know, your ISO, your white balance, your filters, all of that. But with practice, this just, you look at a photo and it becomes second nature to you. I really love this shot, by the way. It's one of my favorites. I love Alpenglow when that blue line starts to push that pink up out of the sky. And a trail always leads your eye right through the photo. And you can see I've positioned the peak to be on the left side of the photo and the the really strong flowers on the right side of the photo with the trail cutting from left to right. Uh, ideal composition for me. It just, it really just guides your eye right in through the middle of that photo. Uh, I love it when that happens. Now, back to uh, really late Alpenglow on Mount Baker. 
Uh, you can see I'm up to six tenths of a second, have that ISO a little bit elevated, white balance is all the way up to 6,400K and a three stop split neutral density filter in hard graduation there. And so the thing about this one is I, I waited a little too long here than I wanted to um, because of that moving wind with the flowers. I just wanted this shot without that ISO 800 or 1000. And while that was all going on, the sun was still setting out to the west, which I had another tripod spot. I made it over there in time to grab one sun star uh, before uh, I missed that and it dropped. Oh, so that was the end of the skyline hike. And that was a whole host of photos from one evening. Um, that's that it really pays to go scout your area beforehand and uh, see all your locations, get to as many as you can. The more adept that you get at doing this in camera photography, the easier it is to move around from locations. Uh, here I've switched to another night hike where I'm poach camping a parking lot. Uh, this is called uh, Heliotrope Ridge. I'm about three and a half, four miles from the car. Again, a pretty steep hike as was Skyline Divide. And we found a really nice set of wildflowers, but not in the greatest position with the biggest view of Baker. Down lower where you could really see this, the Heliotrope Glacier and a better view of Baker, there were no flowers. So I got up so high on the ridge that I wasn't quite happy with the composition, but I was wildflower hunting. So I was destined to shoot something with wildflowers. I do love that you can see the crevasses down there in the glaciers. Uh, this is three stops split neutral density filter, 6,200K on uh, the white balance, still in that landscape roll, F20, one second, two thirds of a stop dark. Luckily the wind was really cooperating. And again, uh, this is looking kind of north and west towards the mountain, south and west, excuse me. This is looking out over the horizon and we just came up all that way out of the bottom of that valley. So took a lot of work to get up there and uh, I probably like this photo better than the photo of Mount Baker. And so onward to the next hike. Uh, this is Park Butte on Mount Baker. Now I've jumped from the north side of Mount Baker to the south side of Mount Baker. And Foxy Dog is doing a good job right there, posing for a photo. Uh, F20, one one hundredth of a second, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 400 to keep Foxy still. And in this photo, we've been taught, let's go back a couple notches here just to talk about where to focus. So again, you've got that really nice group of Indian paintbrush right in the foreground there, immediate. That is not where I focused. Go straight up from that to the next Indian paintbrush, uh, about a third of the way into that, that's where I focused. And in this one, uh, there's some Indian paintbrush there on the right, didn't focus there. If you look right in the middle of the photo and you go to the first white flower, that was my focus point there. But if you have a subject like a foxy dog, you need to focus. I'm trying to focus right on her eyes uh, in that. Uh, really a bluebird sky day uh, to, tonight on this one. Aperture priority F20 ISO um, was at 400 so I could achieve that one one hundredth of a second to freeze her. I've got a two stop split neutral density filter on. And do you use a filter holder? Yes, I do. Uh, not when the polarizer's on, but you know that polarizer comes off fairly early in the evening. I go straight to the holder, which simplifies life uh, greatly. So highly recommended. Is there one that you recommend? Um, so if you go on uh, uh, Singray's website, you'll see there's a Randall Hodges student kit. It comes with a one, two, three stop split neutral density filter. You can add on a four stop and a half stop if you like. You can add on the polarizer if you like. Um, and it comes with a Koken filter holder, uh, which works pretty darn good. Um, I have switched up to, uh, it's called Sioti, S-I-O-T-O. -O, and I just bought it on Amazon for 32 bucks. Uh, I'm a 77 millimeter. So it came with its own, with its ring. It, it is set up for a drop-in polarizer, which I do not care for. 
Uh, so I just bought the holder. But the reason I, I went to that, it has a thinner profile and on my wide angle lens, it will hold up to three filters without the filter holder showing up in the photo. Whereas a Koken, if you wanna have all three slots available, add that extra slot at 16 millimeters, it does show up a little vignetting in the filter holder. But most of my shooting, students are shooting on a Koken. So uh, this night, this was as good as the light ever got. I'm not pointed in the right direction to get Alpenglow. Uh, it's, you can see it's side lighting on Mount Baker. Um, usually I would shoot one of the tarns. There's a series of tarns there. Uh, but I really liked in this photo how I could arrange the, the grassy uh, little islands in my foreground. And notice how I've moved the camera just to get the tip of Mount Baker in that reflection also. Remember to look for those little details. Um, moving Mount Baker into one of those grassy areas would have taken a little bit of punch out of this photo. So for me, I found that to be an important detail. Uh, I went from a two stop split neutral density filter to a three because I don't have a full reflection of light there now. So I need a little more uh, balance of light there, but this nice side light uh, really lighten up the mountain is quite nice. I, I must say, if you go on my website, uh, you'll see a host of photos from Park Butte that are just out of this world. I have this location in both my galleries, just not tonight. All right, and we moved on to the final destination of this trip. Uh, now we've shot Mount Baker from three different locations. Uh, we've shot Mount St. Helens showed up in our photos from three different locations. Mount Adams showed up in our photos. Uh, we got Mount Rainier from multiple locations. The hardest volcano to get to in Washington is Glacier Peak. It is deep wilderness. Uh, when the short trail is open, the shortest trail to it is 16 miles. Uh, this, unfortunately, the short trail was not open. Well, I should say, fortunately, that it was not open because it forced me to do a brand new hike called Glacier Creek Meadows. And right now, I'm, I think I'm standing about 19 miles from the car. So it was a full uh, day and a half of backpacking to get into this location. And this is uh, when I first saw the mountain, it was already getting late. I just dropped my stuff, took my first shot, thinking, okay, if I find nothing else, this will be my sunset spot. I really like the way the trail cuts across the photo and then switch backs. And you can see it way out in the middle of that photo going off in the distance there. Got that warming polarizer on and a one stop graduated in hard graduation. 6,000 K in my landscape roll of film, ISO 100, one stop dark, still shooting aperture priority as always, F20, 125th of a second. And this, by the way, is a three day backpack. So we've gone down, we set up camp, we've made it back up in time uh, to get that last light on Glacier Peak. Really a st stunning mountain. Um, and the wilderness is just so far out there. It's just very few people now. Uh, second day, we're hiking back up past, past that same location and just some really nice clouds and some afternoon light. Just had to get a couple of shots off here. Uh, aperture priority F20, 160th of a second, two thirds of a stop dark, ISO 200. 6,000 K in the landscape roll of film, three stop graduated split neutral density filter and hard graduation. But we were on a mission to shoot from somewhere else. So we were out scouting, that's why we were out early. And now we've climbed what's called a cinder cone and we're well above the valley now. Another shot of foxy dog. Uh, the light was still good enough and she was holding still enough. I was able to keep the ISO low here. Three stop split on top there. And uh, we're still scouting. We got up on top of this. And from the top, we could see that there was a tarn, a small lake down on the other side. So immediately we had to get off of the cinder cone and go look for that. And there it is. And now I'm getting real happy with my composition. This added a lot to it. I love those pops of green in the middle there, which I assume became wildflowers, but it was so high. It was still too early, even though we're getting close to August. Uh, aperture priority. F20, 1 12th of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100, 6100K landscape. Now here's a new trick. I have a three stop graduated split neutral density filter 
on the top. And I have a one stop split neutral density filter upside down in the reflection. So I can literally sandwich that piece of land in the center. So I'm balancing on the bottom, I'm balancing on the top. Uh, and again, if I was using soft filters, this would not work. I, there's no way I could pull this off. Uh, but now I'm very excited that, hey, maybe this is my sunset spot. And I found a new area and it's totally hidden from everybody else because it's sitting behind that cinder cone. And there's the tarn, uh, which makes a great shot in its own right. Uh, so, and I love the, the, the ice that goes down into the lakes whenever I can capture that. Uh, three stop split neutral density filter on top. Uh, didn't have to do the sandwich because I have some land around that tarn there. Fantastic. Now I'm back to uh, the original location. Uh, behind the tarn to get that last sunset light. And uh, a little smoky, I'd say hazy. It wasn't as strong as the uh, last light as I had hoped for, but I was happy that some light did hit that. Um, and again, I'm using that sandwich, a three stop on top and a one stop upside down on the bottom. And now we're back up on top the cinder cone, looking over one of the tarns, shooting back out over the valley that we hiked up in uh, for that sunset. Um, and this was the only place that had color this night, end up being the last shot of the trip. Aperture priority F20, eight tenths of a second, one stop dark, ISO 100, white balance 6400K landscape, a three plus a one again, so I can offset those filters. So I would, I would guess the question about the softs when I offset the filters, I guess I call that a medium. Um, but really the graduation is only split by an eighth of an inch where a soft filter, the graduation is spread out by over an inch. So that's how it's done there. We'll just move on to a contact page here and uh, let's open it up for questions. Let's see how I did time-wise. All right, we made it through that. We did really good. Um, a couple of comments, great presentation, beautiful images. Thank you, Randall and Singray. Um, okay, so when you're doing a long exposure, like a 16 second shot, I assume you're making sure there's no wind or breeze. I'm hoping there's no wind or breeze. <laughs> and, and when I start the exposure, there's probably no wind or breeze, but that doesn't mean it doesn't kick up during that exposure. And sometimes some cuss words come out and uh, sometimes I'm pacing while I'm waiting for the exposure and I talk to mother nature a lot. Please no wind, please no wind, please no wind, please no wind. Uh, and just, you just, you know, patience, uh, other, you know, if you do post-processing, you can always shoot a series of exposures. Um, you can always, uh, you know, shoot a very quick one for the flowers and then add a longer one for the sky. And then, you know, a couple hours later, you might be able to put something together. That's just not the way I want to do it. So for me, um, patience is perfect. And, and uh, on those slower shutter speeds, do you use mirror lockup or are you shooting mirrorless? I am not shooting mirrorless. I'm on a Canon 5D SR and I do use mirror lockup. So I'll click the shutter once and then uh, it will click. I'll let the camera steady and I'll take that second click. And by the way, I, I should have mentioned the other gear. Um, so yes, Canon 5D SR main lens, 24 to 105 Mark II lens. Uh, second favorite lens, 16 to 35 Mark II wide angle lens. Uh, third favorite lens, 100 millimeter macro. And maybe one of these Singray ones, I'll do a macro uh, class or a tulip class. Um, and then my least used lens is a one to 400, uh, but it's still an important lens to have in the kit. That Gitzo tripod, um, I went through all the filters I use and Everything I have, I should say, I have a backup to also. Uh, sometimes these trips can get very expensive. And the last thing you want to do is be out in the field when a piece of equipment breaks. So I have a couple extra bodies. Um, and with all that lens collection, if I break one, I still got uh, three other lenses to use, a backup tripod, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and you mentioned that you tell your students not to pay attention to the histogram, but look at the back of the camera. Is the back of the camera set as raw or JPEG? 
you're looking at a JPEG in the back of the camera, but if you do the conversion I told you about and use the camera software, it's actually on the raw file, but the camera pushes out a JPEG because a raw file is way too big for it to push out. So that JPEG represents what will be on your raw file if you convert it in the camera software. That's a great question, by the way. But um, for those who don't know what a loop is, it's just a little device that shades the back of your camera and it is focusable to your eye and it uh, is slightly magnified. I use that and it is extremely helpful. Um, you know, I don't require my students get it for their first class, but if they're taking one of my bigger adventures, it is strongly recommended because literally just a loop and being able to see the back of your camera will make you twice as good of a photographer because your detail is so much better. So that's another piece of gear I almost forgot about there. Um, let's see. So when you print your images, do you have to make adjustments to have the image like in camera or no change? Yes. Yes. So if you read my bio, uh, even though uh, my goal is to be an all in camera shooter, um, every print medium is different and printing is a whole nother challenge. Uh, a metal print prints, it's, it's a dye sublimation. It prints from five inks. Um, my printers here, we're in my Edmonds gallery, by the way, uh, coming to you live from there. And in the back is my print shop. And I'm running uh, three big Epson printers, a 17 inch, a 24 inch and a 44 inch printer. The paper printer has its own adjustment for it to come out of. The two canvas printers, even though they're both Epson, they are different also. So those files are adjusted to come out of those printers. Um, so printing, I'm lucky I don't, some people have to run profiles and ICC profiles and masks and a whole bunch of stuff to try to figure out what's coming out their printers. I've just figured out my printers. Most of the adjustments I make have to do with uh, brightness. Some of the printers want it, the, expo the uh, photo to be darkened a little bit. Some want the photo to be brightened up a little bit. Uh, so that's what most of my adjustments are. But metal prints are a different animal. With only five inks, the blacks can tend to um, not print correctly. So there are some adjustments made, but the whole goal, my whole goal is that it matches the back of my camera, which is very important to me because if you come in one of my galleries, I'm going to start showing you photos right off the back of my camera. And sometimes I even sell photos off the back of my camera. So uh, I really need those prints to try to match it as closely as possible. Uh, but there does need, that's why in my bio, it says only the uh, smallest adjustments are made so that the print matches the back of the camera as closely as possible. So that, that's a great question though. Let's see. Um, what color palettes would you recommend for a Nikon mirrorless? Okay, so I, I'll just kind of go through some of the color palettes, of the different cameras. And I will say this with a caveat. Again, this only works if you're shooting in JPEG or you process that raw file in the software that came with your camera. If you open it, you do this and you open it in Photoshop or Lightroom, it's going to strip all that away unless you have a plug-in for your camera. So let's start with Canon. Uh, I would set up the standard and landscape roles the same generally, and I can only say generally because all the cameras are slightly different. I move sharpness up one from where it is. I move contrast up two from the middle, and I move saturation up three or four from the middle, depending on the Canon camera. I leave color tone and color hue alone. That would be the basic recipe. Now, if you came to me with a Canon mirrorless, we're going to have a slightly different adjustment. Uh, we might even do a sensor pull. If you came with me with a Canon 6D Mark II, that's going to be a different adjustment, but that's basically it. Nikon, basically all the cameras are the same. You would move sharpness up one, contrast up two, saturation all the way up, especially on the full frame Nikons, the DSLRs. They push the least amount of color, whereas the Nikon mirrorless cameras push more color now. I'm so happy Nikon when they went to like the Z7, they put more color back in the camera. So you may not want your saturation all the way up. It's it, more of a preference. You'll have to shoot a little bit, but that's the basic setting. Up one on sharpness to where it's five. Um, and then you'd go up plus two from the middle on contrast and plus three or four, depending on the camera on saturation. 
uh, very similar for Sony, uh, but Sony is set up differently. In Sony, we would set up the landscape, the standard, uh, and the vivid. And Sony doesn't have as big of adjustment parameter, so it'd be plus one sharpness, plus two contrast, plus three saturation, which is Sony's max. And as Sony's gone on, they've taken more color out of the camera. Everybody's in this dynamic range chase. And the only way to do that is to take some color out of the camera. Um, and then for Fuji, because you can globally adjust all the Fuji films at once, I would go plus one sharpness, plus one contrast, plus one saturation. Fuji already puts its own kind of color magic in the camera. So we don't want to push any of that too far. But for most of my Fujis, that's a pretty good setting. Panasonic, very similar to a Sony. Um, it's very hard to explain over the phone. Uh, really, there is no substitution for coming out in the field and taking a class with me so I can help you through all this step by step, hand by hand, and watch over your shoulder, help you with composition, lighting, all of that, because it all plays a part of in camera photography. But hopefully, that gives you a little bit of a jump start on how to do it there. Um, and by the way, if you go on my website, you get a full list of classes there. Uh, and in the future for people who just can't get out and take a class, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but this whole last year, I went and filmed 14 segments for a, a video series lesson that will be very detailed out. In the, I'm filming my, I was filmed out in the field, um, but my editor is uh, my video guy. He's got a lot of editing to go before we can release that and a lot of edits and cuts and edits and cuts. But eventually there'll be a, uh, two basic class package, which you, you all these represents my actual live out in the field classes, one in Edmonds Beach, one at Wallace Falls here in Washington, that makes up the introductory classes, and then a whole package of advanced classes, mountains and lakes, beaches, fall color, uh, macro and flowers, and, and so on. So eventually, keep an eye on me, you'll see those come out for people who can't get out for a lesson. And that'll be pretty detailed and do pretty good uh, replacement for not being able to get out in the field with me. Um, and can you say again, what file size you shoot? Um, so I'm shooting a 50 megapixel camera. When I convert that into an eight bit TIFF, um, that represents 144 megabyte file size. If I get an order for something beyond a 40 by 60 print, I'll go back to that original raw file and convert it to a 16 bit, which will give me a 288 megabyte file size, which is just plain overkill uh, for anything you know under 40 by 60 and it plugs up computers really fast. So I generally don't do that. Um, and while we're on that subject, let me just give a quick little uh, kind of run through how I handle my files. So one, I am an in-camera deleter. So I shoot, shoot, shoot a sunset. I go back and delete all the ones that are not the ones. So let's say during a sunset, I shot 50 or 100 photos. Delete, 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 delete. I bring home five or 10. That alone makes your life way simpler. Don't bring home 10,000 photos. Bring home the 200 best photos. Uh, I dump all of those. So I have the camera, uh, the Canon software suite. One of those is a utility. So I plug the camera directly into my computer and I've plugged an external hard drive into my computer. Uh, once I turn the camera on, the Canon utility pops up, asks me if I wanna download my latest photos. I say, yes, I send them all to an external drive. The raw files are way too big to go all on my regular computer hard drive. So all those files, say I did a five day trip, they all download and then it, it prompts Canon's DP P4 to pop up. And my last day of shooting is right there across the bottom in a slideshow. And all the days that I've shot, uh, those raw images are right there on the right. So I go back to my first day of shooting of that trip and got my slideshow. And I only pick my very best photos from that slideshow. Now I can see them much bigger on the screen. I have a much better idea. I do my file convert, save as 8-bit TIFF. And I save that TIFF over to my regular computer hard drive. I would consider that a publication or a print file. So let's say from that five day trip, I brought home 500 images. I only end up converting hundred of them over to my regular hard drive. 
And I suggest coming up with some sort of a numbering or lettering scheme for your photos. Um, so all of my raw files went to the external drive in Awesome Images 2021 RAWs. And all my awesome photos, uh, 2022, excuse me, um, that I've converted over to the regular hard drive go into Awesome Images 2022 TIFF files. And my scheme is done by state, date, and number. So uh, if I if this trip was in Washington, it'd be WA underscore 2022 underscore 001 and so forth. I just converted some files from a trip I did Monday night. I'm up in Washington up to 937 for the, for the year there. So that's, that's how I do that. And then those photos in that TIFF version are opened up. Right now I have one spot, sensor spot of dust. I plug that out. I, keyword copyright the image and then it's done it's ready for printing and now that same file gets an adjustment for every different print it might every different printer it might go to with the goal of it matching what's right in the back of my camera so there's the little spiel on how i handle my files oh let's take that another step further my raw files are on external drive my good photos are on my regular hard drive uh, I have Carbonite. It's a, a cloud service. It automatically sees a fo new photos on my computer. It takes it off to the cloud. I have an external drive here in the gallery that I'll plug in once a month, pull all the photos off on that, the TIFFs. And then every other month, I bring another external drive from home, pull all those photos, the new photos and new documents onto that and take that drive home. So I'm really protected, but I sleep good at night. So make sure you're out there protecting your photos. I work hard for my photos. I'm sure you do too. Does deleting the files in your camera card corrupt the card? Uh, yes and no. Another fantastic question. Glad you brought that up. So every day that you shoot, your camera opens a folder. It sticks all of today's images in there. When you erase them, it erases the images, but it leaves the folder. I do like a shoot a card till it's full because I show my customers the back of my camera. Um, but once that card is full and I backed it up, like I said, that card needs to be formatted because and erased and back to new. And the only way to get a card back to new is to format it. Once, once a month or every other month, you need to get all the images off that card and it needs to be reformatted. Otherwise, yes, it'll open so many folders that eventually it plugs it and it and it fails the card. But just, you know, for a month or two, yes, you can delete all the photos you want. Just make sure you go back and format that card. And by the way, when you get a brand new card, you need to stick it in your camera and you need to format it to that camera. Don't just stick it in and start shooting. That card most likely will fail also. So awesome question. Um, do you use a GPS device like a Garmin to help you get to locations or do you stick close to the trail? Uh, well, uh, I use my phone <laughs> not to take photos, um, but I do use stuff like uh, all trails apps or uh, Gaia to track myself in so I can get myself out. And often they have their own maps you can upload to help get yourself to location. Uh, this last year, I did buy a Garmin in reach uh, just for an emergency that when I don't have cell coverage, I want to be able to tell my wife that I'm safe. And if I get lost or hurt, I want to be able to send an SOS. Uh, so it's a little bit expensive, like 400 bucks for the device. And for 12 bucks a month, uh, you're able to send 10 pre-typed texts, which... Uh, I think is a safety issue, uh, especially as I've gotten a little bit older that um, if I'm and, and by myself, uh, that may be my only way to get help. So, but most of the time I'm tracking myself these days on the phone. That's way easier than the old days of whipping out maps and a compass and trying to figure everything out. Oh God, I'm lost. Nope. Just turn on my phone. Oh yeah. Just head back this way. Okay. I think that's it for our questions tonight. If anyone wants to reach out to you, Randall, what's the best way for them to contact you? Oh, uh, well, uh, got some info up here. Uh, the one thing I don't think I put up here was my actual email, which is randall at randalljhodges.com. You can see the uh, website there, www.randalljhodges.com. You can always just uh, direct message me right from my contact page on my website. 
Uh, you can check me out on Facebook, Randall J. Hodges Photography, or just Randall J. Hodges. Instagram's at, and, at Randall J. Hodges. Uh, if you go to my website, you'll see a video series tab. Um, it's listed there as YouTube. And there's a whole series of videos of me being out in the field. They have a little bit of text and techniques, tips and techniques. They're not the lesson series I'm talking about, but you get a real feel for how I'm using those filters and what I'm doing. Um, and on my website, you can call me at the gallery. Uh, my phone number's on there too. And by the way, I, I just want to mention uh, if I can do a little shameless self-promotion. On my website right now, you'll see I have my Images of the Northwest calendar on sale, $10 each, buy two, get one free while we uh, have them in stock. You can also get my Images of the West book, which has 20 years of locations, photography tips, and all of that in there. And you'll also see we're having our holiday sale on there. So if you want to get a print or two, you'll see a lot of these prints that we just did on there. Uh, everything's 10% off. Sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion there. Completely allowed. So we definitely, Randall, want to thank you again for your time this month. These images were breathtaking. And I just love all of your, your in-camera techniques and your so-called old school techniques. Um, I, I think that you have a knowledge base that's really valuable. And so thank you so much for being here. And I appreciate it. And guys, there's a very good chance, you know, next November or December timeframe, I'll either do one or two uh, webinars with Sing Ray again as one of their ambassadors. I always like to get out and teach and uh, help make people aware and just, hey, try to keep that old school photography style alive. And uh, before we sign off here, I just want to say uh, happy shooting, happy hiking, and get out there and have some fun. And happy holidays, everybody. I guess it's that time. Merry Christmas, all that good stuff. That's right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.